All right, hello everybody. My name is Kyla Kwa. I'm the Chief Education Officer of SETS Consulting. Welcome to our very first webinar. I see we have 459 uh, of uh, some great coaches on board, 459. That is phenomenal. Thank you guys so much. I'm honored. I uh, could not think of a better way to spend a Saturday than with 459 of my closest friends. Thank you so much. I do appreciate you taking your time out. I know your time is valuable, so I'm going to try my best to make it worthwhile. Uh, the agenda for today is I will take you through what SETS Consulting is. I'll give you a quick tour of the website. You guys can, can check that out if you'd like after the webinar. Uh, I'd like to give a, a brief bio or background of, of myself. And then I'd like to take you through our webinar that I promised you, which is the five acts that every tennis teaching professional should be doing right now during COVID-19. Sound good? So uh, let's go ahead. Let's uh, get into it. Uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about myself. I, I, I don't really like to, but I know that's kind of a necessity. So uh, just kind of bear with me here. Uh, real, real quickly, I grew up in, in Florida in the Tampa area. I uh, grew up playing tennis. I was actually a competitive swimmer when I was when I was young, and then I kind of switched over to tennis. The tennis bug bit me really, really hard, and I've been hooked ever since. Grew up playing junior tennis, did all the junior tournaments, traveled all over, uh, had a great time, wonderful experience, great time battling all the tennis academy kids down here in South Florida with Boletary and Everett Academy in Saddlebrook, but I think I held my own. So it, it was a wonderful time. Uh, after juniors, I had an opportunity to go up to, uh, to this small Division II school in Michigan called Ferris State University. And what was so special about Ferris State is that they had this program called Professional Tennis Management. And I knew from a pretty early age I wanted to stay involved in tennis, but I never really knew how. I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to just be in the industry, but I didn't really know uh, how to go about it. And this program kind of came up and I heard about it. And I said, this is absolutely perfect. This program was made for me. And I went up and I learned some teaching skills, some coaching skills, met a lot of amazing industry people. Uh, got out of there uh, in about three and a half years, actually a little bit ahead of time got out of there in three and a half years, and I then went to the University of Michigan, uh, received my MBA from the University of Michigan, uh, and then just fast forward real quick, uh, I have another master's degree from Stanford University, uh, just completed that this past April, so uh, very excited for that. It's a, it's a master's in education, educational leadership specifically. So real happy to have done that. Going, going backwards a little bit, backtracking. After Michigan, I, I came down to Florida, uh, have a, uh, had a job down in Florida. Um, took a little bit to, to get it, but luckily for me, I, I, I did get the job in Boca Raton. Brand new construction, private club, high-end uh, luxury and I've been there for 16 years, uh, still at the same club. Now, before this, I've obviously had some other coaching experience. I was at Saddlebrook Resort. I was a coach there for about two and a half, almost three years. Uh, I actually was very lucky. I, I got a great job. They offered it to me. I was 19, I know, 20 years old. Um, and I had grown up uh, about... 30, 35 minutes away from Saddlebrook Resort. So I was familiar with the place. I, I knew a few of the coaches. I actually went to high school and played on the high school team with one of the coaches. So uh, they, they knew me pretty well and they were able to, to kind of take that risk and hire me, uh, even though I was, I was very young. Uh, but they knew I was responsible. I was respectful. I was honest. I, I knew how to handle myself in, in that sort of situation. So they, they took that risk, they hired me, and at first I just started working with some of the campers, juniors and adults, 
had a really good time. Then they moved me up to, to the academy, uh, which I had a great time with. And then they got me involved more in the uh, managerial side of, of player development. And that was great because during that time, early 2000s, we had uh, Hingis, Capriati, Justine Ennen uh, was coming up. Uh, James Blake on the men's side. So it was a, a very unique environment, to say the least, uh, with, with, with all of those players there. And uh, maybe I'll share some stories in a future webinar. Uh, this one's probably not, not the time or the place, but uh, I had an amazing time at Saddlebrook Resort. Uh, really enjoyed myself. I still have a great relationship with them. Uh, but just, just wonderful, uh, a wonderful time in my life. So many, so many great memories. Uh, so after Saddlebrook, uh, I was offered a job up in Philadelphia at a beautiful club, Philadelphia Cricket Club. And uh, 24 grass courts, it hosted the ITF uh, Junior Grass Courts, which was kind of that grass court swing in the summer right before they went over to Europe to play uh, at, at Wimbledon, Junior Wimbledon. So we had a lot of high-level junior players uh, playing in, in that one. Great experience again uh, with the membership, everything else. So uh, that's a that's a very brief background of uh, of my tennis um, during this time as well, and over the past 16 years being based in Boca Raton. Uh, obviously, for those of you familiar with South Florida, it is a tennis hotbed. There's lots of tennis players down here, uh, both amateurs, juniors, and professionals. So uh, I've had a, I, I, I've been very lucky to, to meet so many of them and, and become friends with, with, with quite a few. But I've also done some, some technical advising with uh, a few players, uh, their coaching staff, uh, things like that. So, uh, again, just really, really fortunate, really blessed. But I, I found out that my, my best skill is kind of that being in that technical advisor role, not just for the players per se but also for, for the coaches. I really enjoyed working with the coaches more than the players. Not that the players are bad, but I, I just had a, a, a great connection helping those coaches, those great coaches, become even better. And so I think one of the things that really struck me is I've been fortunate enough to be part of the USPTA, and I've been a USPTA tester for – I believe 13 years now, which, which is incredible. I started very, very young as a tester. I was probably the youngest tester in the country. In fact, I, I know for a fact I was the youngest tester in the country. Uh, and it's something I've always enjoyed. And USPTA uh, granted me this amazing opportunity to help out with the pro-university course uh, for the ATP and WTA tours. So I did that for about two years. Uh, which was great. I made a lot of friends. And for those of you not familiar with the, the Pro U course, uh, it's a educational curriculum for players on, the, on both tours, ATP and WTA, that were looking to transition uh, off the tour and into a coaching role somehow. So I was able to help certify them and be able to teach them some some coaching basics because I'm sure as as many of you know being a great player doesn't always guarantee that you are a great coach uh, I've tested over a thousand USPTA professionals and I can tell some that come with the best playing credentials don't always make uh, the most ideal coaches so it was it was a little bit surreal and a little bit challenging sometimes being able to help these great players become great coaches. Uh, but I'm, I'm really proud of my work that I did there. Uh, again, made some great relationships. And this was held a lot of times at the Miami Open uh, in Key Biscayne, when it was still in Key Biscayne. And it was just surreal being on a court surrounded by, you know, 15 to 20 ATP WTA professionals and having to show them or try to teach them how to hit a backhand volley, or at least how to explain how to hit a backhand volley, because for most of them, it was just so natural, they never really had to think about it. So uh, that's, that's, that's one of the, the, the good memories I, I've, I've had. 
Um, so it was kind of from this experience that I really enjoyed working with these high level players and high level coaches and being able to, to take them to another place to get them to think about things in maybe a little bit of a different way. Uh, so in essence, that's really what, what sets consulting is. It's, it's being able to help again, uh, great coaches become even better. And by helping them, it's only going to help their players. It's going to be able to create better connections. It's going to be able to create a higher level of performance, uh, some good problem solving skills as well. So enough about me. Uh, I'll, I have tons of stories that I would love to share with you and I'm sure we can in future webinars, but for right now, I want to try to keep it uh, as brief as possible. And what I would love to do is I'd love to take you through a tour of the website. So if you don't mind, I would love to share the screen with you. And I'll take you on a quick tour of the website. Like I said, I would love for you guys to, to be able to check this out on your own, uh, on your own time. If you have any questions, please feel free. My contact information is there. I'm easy to find, uh, both figuratively and literally. Uh, so please take a look. I will take you through it. Our tagline is setting you up to set you apart. And what SETS stands for, as you can see, is Specialized Educational Tennis Solutions. And we really want to take the best of the best uh, in terms of, of coaching. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to take those great coaches, and again, we want to take them to another level, uh, a better level of connection for their students. And we do this in a few ways. So again, yes, I, I do work with, with some private clients and I, I thoroughly enjoy that, but I, I'm really uh, looking towards helping, helping coaches. So I've had some great experiences doing it. Uh, fantastic stuff. A few testimonials down here, everything else. But what I want to take you through is really about uh, what is it about SETS Consulting that kind of makes us a little bit different, that sets us apart? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to help coaches and especially tennis federations uh, with their educational curriculum. Uh, I am working with or I have worked with a few federations uh, in the past and recently. Um, some of these federations are based in Europe. And I kind of help them out with their coaching education in terms of what the coaches want, what the coaches need to learn. And then we kind of take it through step by step. But quick background of education uh, committees. I am heavily involved with USPTA. Uh, I've done some work with also the Discovery Channel. Uh, I did a, uh, a quick series for the Discovery Channel, which I had an amazing time with. But uh, it's it's... Pretty, pretty comprehensive. Uh, we really love to work, again, coaches, federations. Yes, we can help with the player development. I also love to work with clubs, uh, teams, uh, college tennis teams, even high school teams. I have no problems with that. Want to make sure that uh, staff development is good. So a new club, maybe they had some turnover. They want to bring a new staff on. They want to get them up to date. It's important to have a staff that's kind of has the same philosophy uh, in terms of, of teaching. They don't have to be robots, but I think it's very important that they're all kind of on the same page in terms of uh, what, they, what they teach or kind of what style uh, they want to teach in, just so that the student is getting uh, some consistency throughout. I also do a lot of uh, speaking at conventions, tennis conferences, uh, I enjoy doing that. Love meeting all the coaches. I love all their questions. We also do some technical analysis and, and industry expert analysis for, for media. Like I said, work, worked with the Discovery Channel a little bit. Had an awesome time with that. Also work with clubs, uh, facility consulting. I'm actually working with Palm Beach Gardens Tennis Center right now. They're building a brand new 12,000 square foot clubhouse uh, with a restaurant in it and they actually want me in there and they're having me help out with the restaurant so 
uh, which I do have a background in. My, my dad owned several restaurants, so I, I actually grew up in that industry a little bit, having, having a great time with that. And I will have some future webinars, so please pay attention to this site. I'm going to be scheduling a few webinars that will be listed on this page. Uh, so the webinar that we are on right now has already been taken off since it started already, but please keep in mind I will be doing some more webinars Again, I look to do about one webinar a week and I will have a description and maybe even some special guests coming up. One thing I really love to do too is I love to, I love to write. Uh, it's one of, my, one of my favorite hobbies. And so I started writing a little bit for um, Mr. John Yandel who runs tennisplayer.net. If you're not familiar with tennisplayer.net, uh, I highly recommend that you, you check out the website. They have a lot of great instructional articles, uh, high-speed video, but I'd probably say my opus was this seven-part comprehensive series I did on the serve and volley. Uh, for those of you that do know me, I'm, I'm fairly old school with that, and I, I do love getting to the net, uh, and I am a big advocate for it, but I did do a seven-part series on serve and volley. I have a couple other articles here, too. Um, just really really enjoyable stuff. So please take a look at that if you'd like. If you're more interested in kind of my philosophy and, and what I'm about, uh, there's, no better, there's no better chance than, than taking a look at this website or going on tennisplayer.net and reading some of those articles. And again, if you want to contact me, my information is here. I, please, I would love to hear from you. So that's a very brief uh, go through of the website. So again, please put this in your, in your favorites and let's see, let's see how we can help you. Uh, I would love to. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna go back actually. So you guys can see me and the logo, obviously. Like I said, you guys are gonna get sick of that, but that's okay. So now if you want to, let's go ahead and we are going to go through uh, the webinar. Okay, again, this is five things that every tennis teaching professional should be doing during COVID-19. I think it's uh, very important. It's fantastic that we, in fact, go over this. I know it's, it's unprecedented times. Um, I think the word unprecedented has probably never been used more than in the last two or three months, which I guess ironically makes that unprecedented who knows but um it, it is scary times and i do know that a lot of pros are really hurting right now uh so uh it, it really depends on your geographic location too i know some places are completely shut down other places are now talking about already going into phase two uh which is starting to slowly reopen so uh, it, it's, it's just, a, it's just a weird environment right now, but I, am kind of doing this webinar too, just to, just to help you guys out, uh, give you guys some insights, some ideas that you guys can, can take back to your jobs, your clubs, all the way to, to your students. So I say we go ahead and we get into this webinar, shall we? Okay. So here's, uh, here's the start of it. I will take you through. We have about 10 slides, nine or 10 slides. So like I said, it should be, should be fairly simple, but I do want to get into some, some good details on, on quite a few of these topics. So anytime I start a project or even a webinar, I, I always like to have objectives and goals. And this is important if you're doing a project, if you're working with a coach, if you're working with a player, it's just important to kind of know where we're headed to. So ideally, and again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because all of you, 459 of you, uh, much to my surprise and happiness for that matter, uh, have joined me. So we, we want to remain engaged and educated in our careers. Clearly, all of you guys are doing that by, by joining me here, and I do appreciate it. But we do want to remain engaged and educated in our careers obviously that constant growth, right? We never want to stop growing. We never want to stop learning. As, as I like to say, don't go through life, grow through life. So I think it's very important. 
Also, we want to try to use a SWOT analysis for ourselves in our current situations. So it's not just a SWOT analysis for business, but also personally. And there's some slides in the future that we will go over that specifically. And I think that's really important. We don't just want to do it with, with ourselves and with our business. We can do it with, with any situation and we can do it with, with our players as well. Uh, third one, obviously we want to gain a better perspective. Oftentimes we're under so much stress and things are happening so fast that we tend to lose that perspective. We, we start rushing and we really stop thinking. And so sometimes we need to pump the brakes a little bit and, and check ourselves. And obviously we want to have the confidence and prepare for what is to come. There's an amazing opportunity out there for those of you that are willing to step forward and to step up and to go for it. And we will discuss that, but please seize the day. Okay, anytime that we are looking at a problem or a situation, again, it can be a, a, a worldwide problem, it could be a, a personal issue, it could be an issue with a player. I always like to think about what is true. In other words, I need facts. I need really true, cold, hard facts to be able to base my counterattack off of, right? Just like you would be playing in a match, you want to be able to see the statistics after the first set. What are you doing that is causing this to happen? If anything, sometimes it might be completely out of your control, but whatever it is, it's important to understand what is true. Based on the facts and based on what is true, we can then come up with a solution or a strategy or tactics that can help us. So the first thing, your job, career, and life has been significantly impacted. That is a guarantee, right? Uh, coming up to 3 million cases, 2.7 million cases around the world, 187,000 deaths. In the USA alone, there's 800... 60,000 cases and 44,000 deaths. So clearly, uh, maybe we, we know people, we have, we have friends, relatives that have also been affected with this. Um, it, it's just terrible. It, it really is. And, and this is going to change how we do things from now on. So obviously, there, there's a bit of a safety and health issue here, uh, which we'll get into. Also, another thing, social distancing and isolation, obviously with everyone uh, obviously staying separated, keeping their distance, some of, some of us being quarantined, uh, it, it can create a, a depression. And here's a, here's a crazy fact. The mortality rate for loneliness is 25%. For air pollution, it's just 5%, which is still 5% more than what it should be. But for that matter, uh, 25%. Uh, for loneliness is the mortality rate. Wow, that's just incredible. Uh, so we have to come up with now an idea or a solution to that problem, uh, perhaps with our members, something like that. So that's going to be on a future slide coming up. Economic uncertainty makes way for ingenuity and innovation. So there's never been a better time. Uh, and again, this is, this is a fact. The, in, in environments like these, it creates a completely new type of entrepreneur. And yes, there is a moment to strike. A whole bunch of bad things are going on right now. The economy, uh, people are a little bit skeptical on that. People's health, uh, the whole financial industry, just everything. But within all this chaos does lie opportunity. Also, there's no substitute for a good beginning. The reset button has been at anything that you were doing up until this point in 2020 that might have been a little bit off or you weren't getting the same results, you get a redo. How amazing is that? So let's take full advantage of that. Also, displaying positive emotions are momentum swingers, okay? There's a big difference between being melancholy and being truly, genuinely happy and it makes a bigger difference than you think. So based on, based on uh, 
these facts, we are going to come up with some ideas and solutions to be able to address all these. And if we can execute on those ideas and those strategies, I have no doubts that you guys are going to absolutely soar. Okay, the first step, and this might be the most important one. The first step is you have to take care of yourself. You cannot be helpful to anybody else if you do not first take care of yourself, both physically and mentally. The physical side, just stay safe, all right? Do what you're supposed to do. Stay inside, stay home if you have to. I know some of you might still be out there outside, even teaching if your club is open. That's fantastic. But again, you are the first priority. You have to take care of yourself. Also, I know we have very physically demanding jobs if, if we're on court teaching a lot. But for those of you that are no longer teaching, this is an amazing time to get some rest, to actually, to actually heal your bodies. I'm 37 years old, and uh, I'm on my way to two uh, hip replacements, uh, a double hip replacement. Uh, my hips have been killing me. Uh, they haven't been in the best shape. But you know what? This rest, being able to stay off the court a little bit, uh, has really helped me. And I, I've really dedicated myself to being able to get in better shape. Not that I was out of shape in the first place, but being able to to really hone in and get my hips better. And my hips have actually never felt better. I, I, I've, just, I've just been really conscious of taking care of myself. Uh, and it's been, it's been great. And I can't wait to get back out on the court, test the hips a little bit, should be great. But again, take advantage of this time. Yes, I know you'd rather be on court working, but since you're not, maybe, maybe it's a sign that you gotta, you gotta take care of yourself, okay? Also mentally, education, expand your horizons. This is critical. USPTA has done a great job with some webinars. They've had a, a whole lot of good ones recently. I think in the last, the last two or three weeks, they've had five or six, which has been fantastic. So the whole industry has stepped up. USTA has had webinars, USPTA, uh, the ITF. If, if you guys go online to the ITF Academy, uh, they have a whole list of of classes and courses that you can take and you get a, a nice little uh, certification. Also, Orange Coach. If you guys are not familiar with Orange Coach, uh, I recommend that you check them out. Uh, they have been having some amazing webinars. I've learned so much through these webinars and I've also gained a lot more confidence. Um, it's really an Orange Coach exchange where they're exchanging ideas and talking about uh, all of their experiences, extremely, extremely helpful. So if you are not familiar with Orange Coach, please check them out. They are doing a great service right now and, and stepping up to the plate by helping all the coaches out. Uh, Mark, Kovacs, uh, Mark Kovacs, PhD, he's been having some webinars as well. Uh, good one on the serve this past week. Also, some podcasts. Uh, if you're into, if if you have an interest outside of tennis, that's fantastic. Now's the time. Try to try to just get your mind to exercise a little bit. Get your mind out there. Start thinking about maybe some other hobbies that you like. But hey, now's the best time for for some growth. Uh, another one that I did not put down, but uh, I know that uh, only because I live about 15 minutes away is Florida Atlantic University. FAU is having a course on uh, tourism and hospitality management and I know this because everybody every tennis coach on LinkedIn is, is posting their, their certification on it it is a fantastic program so that's Florida Atlantic University I'm sure it's easy to, to look up but I know a lot of coaches are very happy with that course and with that program so there's tons of ways that we can still improve ourselves professionally even though we're not on the court also, another thing that I like to do, which I think is, is critical, and I wish I had been doing this years ago, but uh, I just started within probably the last year and a half, and that is self-reflection. I think self-reflection is, is so critically important, and whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it's just looking back at, at your day or at your week 
and being able to ask yourself, you know, what, what did I do well? What did I absolutely crush out of the park? What am I really the most proud of that I accomplished today? And then, you know, things that maybe you could have done better. It's important to, to be honest with yourself and have that, what we would call radical transparency, right? Where, again, you're not being negative with yourself, but you just want to know what could I have done a little bit better if, if I had that chance. Uh, but self-reflection is critical. Uh, and I do recommend this. If, if, you're, not, if you're not already self-reflecting, uh, there's no better time to start than right now. So please make sure that that's a, that's a daily part of your routine. I want to go over real quickly what I call the three-foot world concept. Uh, what this is, and if, if, if you guys are, are sitting at home or, or wherever, if you just stretch your arms all the way out, stretch them out as far as you can, and you're going to see that maybe they reach three feet. Maybe it depends on, on the length of your arms, how lanky you are, whatever. But ideally, it's going to be somewhere around or maybe close to, to three feet, give or take. So once you're, those arms are stretched out, I want you to think about what you can actually touch, what you can reach with those arms. Whatever you can reach with your outstretched arms is great. You can control that. You can manipulate that. Whatever you want to do to that object or that thing that you can reach and touch is great. That's all yours. But if it's, with, if it's outside of your outstretched arms, or it's too far away, you can't worry about it. You have to let it go. You cannot control that. So in the grand scheme of things, what does that mean? It means you have to take care of whatever is around in that three foot world of yours. That is all you can physically control, okay? For a lot of people, they have a hard time with this, especially competitive athletes who might be uh, perfectionists right? They, they want to try to control every other little thing around them. And if something is a little bit off, it just completely throws them for a loop. So this is the three foot world. Make sure we stay in our three foot world. Now this is going to sound uh, like a major dichotomy uh, based on some of the future slides that we're going to see. But for the most part, this has to be your first priority is take care of what's within your three foot world. Once you have all of those things perfect, then you can start going outside of that. But for right now, make sure that your three-foot world is great. So I have in quotes there too much worry. Uh, this is something that my father said to me. So a uh, little background here. My, uh, my, my father passed away last year, 2019, uh, January 24th. I saw the last I saw him was 2018 around the holidays. I think it was either Christmas or, or, or maybe New Year's Eve. And uh, he had a terminal illness. So he, he knew that he was he was probably going to be going soon. I, I still didn't. I think I was a little bit. Um, I think I was a little bit in, in denial. Uh, but anyways, long story short. We uh, we spoke um, quite a bit just about life and everything. And, you know, he said one of his biggest regrets, he, he told me this, one of his biggest regrets is that in his life, there was just too much worry. He worried so much. He had some stressful jobs and he just, he worried so much. And when he would worry that much, he would get stressed, obviously, and he would come home and he would kind of self-medicate with, with alcohol and, and, and cigarettes and things like that. And he just said, you know, looking back, there's nothing he, he could have done uh, for a lot of the stuff that he was worrying about. A lot of those things were out of his control or a lot of those things pretty much took care of themselves uh, so that when he did worry, he would realize later on that there was no reason to worry because they either fixed themselves, took care of themselves, but something happened. So, um, but that was one of his biggest regrets is that he spent too much time worrying because he kind of stayed outside of that three foot world. Instead of, instead of focusing on, on what he could control, he was worried about a lot of things that he couldn't control. Uh, so that, that was a very important lesson. When he told me that, 
um, it really changed the way that, that I also look at things. And I think if you talk to people that, that know me or that have known me for quite a few years, they would probably tell you that they have noticed a significant difference in, in how I view things. Uh, but anyways, something to, to kind of take home for you guys is, is stay in that three foot world and try not to worry too much about all the outside stuff that's four feet away and more. Just, just stay in that three foot radius. Okay, number two, stay engaged with your students and membership. Yes, they still exist just because they're not coming to the courts or they're not texting you every day about upcoming matches and things like this. They still exist. So we need to make sure that they are doing okay. And this is what I talked about with the dichotomy. Yes, make sure you're taking care of yourself. But once you've got that three foot world handled, please go out, reach out to your, reach out to your members, reach out to your students, reach out to your players. Think about how you can reach out. Even though you can't teach them on the court, maybe you can teach them in other ways. What about your virtual capabilities? Maybe do a stroke analysis for some of them. Maybe you have an online academy. I know in my club, I created a, a virtual online tennis academy. And what that was, very simple, is I just took a, a few clips and highlights of some players and I talk about the forehand, the serve, the backhand, the one-handed backhand, the two-handed backhand, the volleys. And I do some voiceover stuff um, in terms of, you know, just talking about, okay, this is what happens on the backswing. This is what happens on the forward swing. This is what the contact point can look like. And I have sent them an email every single day uh, highlighting, you know, some, some component of a swing. And they've really enjoyed it. Uh, also, you can send out some different mental emails or mental toughness emails. And um, I know what, one of the things we do too in our academy is we do case studies. So I treat it like it's an actual class. So we will do case studies. I know last week we did a case study on the Stan Varinka backhand. Uh, and we'll do a case study on the serve. Um, so just really interesting things like that, just to keep them engaged and to, make, to maybe give them some, some sort of visual cues so that they can actually practice at home. Um, the, the brain, the Dr. Jim Lehrer said, said this, and I thought it was so interesting, and it's, it, it's been proven, is that the brain, the human brain does not recognize between you physically doing something and you visualizing it. So even though you're not on the court hitting a ball, you can still be in the living room swinging your racket, visualizing that over and over again, and you can still improve. So please don't overlook the power of, of being able to do something online. Uh, it does work. And like I said, this won't be forever, but if your virtual capabilities are showing some sort of results or people like them, you can continue and you can build on this uh, as, as another sort of platform or even an, another revenue stream. Uh, but again, just make sure that you reach out to your membership, make sure that you, you thoroughly enjoy, uh, what it is that you're putting out there and just let them know that you are thinking about them and you're still providing them some sort of tennis education. Uh, it might not be the tennis education that they want because they want to be on court with you, but this is the next best thing and they will appreciate it. Also, make sure in terms of the global pandemic and maybe opening procedures for the club, make sure you reassure them. Make sure you let them know that you're safe. Make sure you let them know that the club or your facility is doing everything possible in order to, uh, in order to make sure that they have a positive experience when they do come back. Make sure that the facility is up the facility is clean, the facility might, might have a facelift. I know at my club, even though we suspended operations about a month ago, um, we are still there working. We've been able to retain all 19 of our full-time staff members, and we have been painting fences. We've been resurfacing courts. We've been putting up windscreens. We've been doing all these little things that are going to make this club 
looks so beautiful when people come back. It's going to be like a, a re grand opening and it's going to, it's going to kind of instill that excitement back in the, in the members. And they're going to love that. I think it's important to understand though, if you do work at a club, any communications that go out to the membership should probably be coming from one source in terms of the COVID-19 uh, preparations, how you're handling everything. If, if you wanted to come from the director of tennis or the GM, that's fine. But just make sure that that sort of information, that serious information is coming from one source. That way, it's just a consistent voice. There's not a whole bunch of noise going around it. And they know that the membership will understand that when it does come from that one single voice, it's serious and it means business. Uh, oftentimes there, there can be a little bit too many, too many cooks in the kitchen and then the message starts to get, starts to get watered down. So I think that's very important to understand. Just make sure all the serious updates and information regarding uh, the clubhouse's response and preparation for a reopening is coming from one single source. Also, make sure that you're visible. Get online. Uh, make some make some funny videos and send them to to your membership. I know one thing that the staff is doing at my club is we came up with some different drills to do at home, and we've sent that out to all the members. So it, it's it's a fantastic thing. The members really enjoy. It. They they like seeing us that we have a positive outlook on things that we're trying to do and trying to be creative and trying to help them uh, get through this time as well. So absolutely be visible, make sure that they see you, make sure that they know everything is okay. Okay, so number three, okay, hear the knock at the door, that's opportunity. You have to open it up, okay? This is an amazing time to make something of yourself. I guarantee you in the next, the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, the most famous coach, the most popular pro is going to be somebody that started an idea or business from this moment right now. It's an amazing opportunity. There's never been a better moment to strike. And this is where we go into a SWOT analysis. You really have to take an honest, an honest look. And this is where self-reflection helps. You have to take an honest look at what your game looks like. And when I say game, I mean your career. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats? Whatever your strengths are, I want you to emphasize those, circle those, try to do more of that, okay? In terms of your weakness, and yes, we all have them, uh, in terms of your weakness, you know, it's important to understand that, but you also have to ask yourself the question, is my weakness worth getting better? And if so, what's it really going to take? It's funny, when we work with players, we, we often look at their strengths and weaknesses, and a lot of coaches, especially inexperienced coaches, will look at a weakness and say, oh, well, that, that, that has to get better, that has to get better. And what ends up happening is they spend so much time working on the weakness that they, the player will lose confidence in their strength because they're just so frustrated. Ultimately, your weakness is always going to be a weakness. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you emphasize the strengths and you find a way to make those strengths even stronger, now you're on to something. Now those weaknesses might not even matter, okay? You also got to see what the opportunity is out there. The opportunity is critical. What can you possibly do? Or what is a space, a market that is open? Is there a niche that is underserved? What can you be doing right now to take advantage of this time? And then obviously threats. Well, the biggest threat obviously is this COVID-19, uh, the economic uncertainty. But again, if we focus on the strengths, then a lot of these things are going to just kind of either go away disappear or not be as impactful. So, but it is important to still do that SWOT analysis. And again, self-reflection is key here. Take an honest, hard look at what your career is, at what you're good at, and try to make something of it. So recessions create 
a very specific breed of entrepreneurs, right? These are survivalists. And, and what I mean by that is these, these survivalists are not innovators, right? They, they, they simply are people who find a need that the public wants and they're able to, to go after that and be able to exploit that. And here's a few examples. Obviously, uh, we, all, we all know J. Paul Getty from oil, but George Jenkins, uh, public supermarkets. If you live in Florida or you've ever been to Florida, you know what a public supermarket is. Uh, where I live, I have, I think, six public supermarkets within a seven-mile radius of me. So, yeah, Publix is, is, is pretty popular. And George Jenkins, I think he was worth $30 billion. Uh, the Boyle family, they created uh, sportswear, Columbia Sportswear, Marriott, uh, obviously Marriott Hotels, but he actually started in food. He owned a couple A&W root beer um, stalls, and he, he later kind of transferred that into hotels. And then there's this guy, Charles Darrow. Um, he created the board game Monopoly. Now, what's interesting is that all these families or, or, or people is that they created this wealth. They started during the Great Depression. And so even during the worst of times, they were able to find something that the public needed and they were able to provide that. So even during the darkest times, that is sometimes the best opportunity. What's interesting about, about all of these, all of these people is that if you look at the industry they got into, right? Uh, Publix, uh, Marriott, they, they really focused on food. They started with food first, but then you go with food, uh, you go with clothing, um, and then you go with, with housing, with, with hotels for Marriott. These are things that people absolutely have to have. So when you look at that, that's going to be the challenge for us tennis professionals is obviously taking a tennis lesson it, it is a bit of a luxury, but how can we make it, how can we make our business possible where we feel like people have to have it, right? How do we create that demand? That's going to be a question for you guys as to how we do that. But if you think about it, there are numerous ways to make yourself in high, high demand. Uh, but again, it, it, if all of these people can do it, you guys can do it too. And I'm not saying uh, that you're going to be a billionaire from being a tennis coach, but don't you think if you try how much fun that would be, right? Ima imagine trying to be the first billionaire tennis coach, right? That, that might be pretty cool. Um, but again, th th this just gives you guys some inspiration on on um, just what the opportunity is like. Even during the Great Depression, all of, these, all of these people made millions, if not billions of dollars. So I want you to think about it this way. Here's an interesting concept that I, I just started thinking about uh, a few weeks ago. You wanna treat your life and career like the stock market. And what I mean by that is when the stock market is at its highest, right? Everyone's making money, things are going well. There's not really a whole lot of good value there because prices are just so high. Now, if you own stock, that's great. You're gonna to continue to make money and you're just gonna to continue to ride that wave. But for you men and women out there that might've been hitting a speed bump in your life or in your career, maybe your personal stock price is at an all time low or close to a low, let's say a 52 week low. If, if your personal stock price is at, a, is at a low, just imagine what would happen if you invest in that price now, when it starts to build back up again, which it will, that's a guarantee, right? The stock market's always gonna go up. There's never been a greater generator of wealth in the world than the stock market. So even though your personal stock is at a low, if you can invest enough money in that stock or enough time in that stock, when it starts to go up again, imagine how many shares of that stock you will now have, and then it just starts building again. So this is the best time to invest in yourself. Uh, maybe your hours have been cut. Maybe, maybe you've lost your job. 
but this is a great time to start thinking about your next move. How are you going to invest in yourself? Because there's no better value than right now. Okay. You always get better value at the bottom and then you kind of work your way up again, but just think about that and, and try to take your life and put it into those terms. Uh, I think that's really important to kind of have that attitude, but definitely you want to start investing right now. Okay. So when you do open up for your club or your facility, or even if you're a personal private coach, uh, for some of your players that you haven't been able to see, you still want to go over some sort of standard operating procedure, right? What is your what is your hygiene and illness protocol going to be like? Are you going to scrub down the tables and chairs uh, every single lesson? Uh, are you going to provide uh, tennis tubes and ball hoppers for your students to pick up? Or is it the coach that can only touch the balls? Um, those, those are things you have to start thinking about and you have to start writing them down. When people come back to tennis, you're going to, you're, you're going to have a few different groups of people. You're going to have your people who are just gung ho. They don't care. They're coming out there. They're going to pick up every ball they want to. They just want to play. They, they've been cooped up in their homes. They're sick of it. They want to get out and just go crazy. Then you're going to have your group of people who are going to be a little bit tentative. They're going to be a little bit scared and they're unsure of just how safe things really are. Maybe it's a little too soon for them. Then you're going to have a group that for the most part is still terrified. They might only want to take a private lesson. Maybe they don't want to do a clinic, something like that. Um, or they just still, it's still a little bit too soon for them and they want the curve not only to be flattened, but completely gone. They don't want to hear one more thing about the coronavirus. They're going to stay in their house the whole time, and it's going to be hard to get them out. Either way, your job in the first few weeks coming back is going to be like a poultry farmer, right? And what I mean by that is you're going to be walking on eggshells the entire time. So you have to be very, very uh, intuitive in, in terms of, understanding what your members or what your students are really feeling. And you have to get that feeling just right. Just like when you're working with a player, that intuition, that feeling, if you don't get that feeling right, if you, if you can't feel out that player, you can't feel out that student, uh, it's, it's gonna be very, very tough. So you have to be empathetic. Uh, you have to be open-minded. You have to understand where their fears might be how they're feeling. You have to really understand, engage that situation. Uh, programming, right? What, well, actually, before we go into programming, let's talk about those, those initial fears, right? You really want to overly communicate. Uh, you want to give as much information as possible. Send out a mass email to, to your students, to the membership. Let them know all the steps that you are taking. Uh, make sure that you do your best to make them feel comfortable because once they feel comfortable, that's when they're going to start coming out. And then once a few come out, they're going to share with your friends. Hey, I, 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 I was out of the tennis center a few days ago. It was great. They had the place clean. They're doing all the right things. So all of a sudden that word is going to start to, is going to start to build um, just, just through that word of mouth. And obviously people, members, they, they, they all like to talk. So, I think it's really important just to overly communicate and not just that, but when they get to your courts, actually demonstrate, show them that you are actually physically cleaning the table. Don't just, don't just have something on a table saying, Oh, we, we clean the tables every hour and then you don't actually do it. Actually show them when, as soon as they start the lesson, say, excuse me, just give me two minutes. I need to wipe down this table and you can overdo it. Be, be as dramatic as you want to be. But for me, I clean all the tables. I clean the legs of the table. I clean the chairs. I clean the backs of the chairs. I just go above and beyond just to reassure them that everything is going to be okay. They just need that confidence. Okay. In terms of programming, how is that going to, to evolve? Are you going to have a summer camp uh, with all those kids running around and everything else? Is that the safest thing for you to do? I'm not saying yes or no, right or wrong, 
but these are questions that you truly have to think about. Are you going to have uh, clinics? If so, how many people on a court? Are you only going to do private lessons? Are you going to allow uh, your membership? Are you going to allow people from the outside? What's going to happen uh, with, with all of these programming uh, ideas, right? You, you, you just have to make sure that when you do this, again, it is organized. Try not to do it on the fly. You have to be able to prepare right now for what is going to happen. Like I said, a lot of places are now going to phase two. They're opening up some public parks. Um, tennis centers are now starting to talk about a, a reopening date. My members are texting me every day about when, when we will open again. But before we can do this, before you can open, you need to make sure that you have an ironclad uh, standard operating procedures as to how this is going to be and how this is going to happen. In terms of pricing, what would you want to do on pricing? Uh, if you're going to take some time to wash down or to clean down and disinfect the tables and chairs by the court, uh, is it now going to be a 50 minute lesson? Or are you just going to go over time and just be late for the rest of the day, lesson after lesson? Again, I'm not saying what you should or shouldn't do. For me personally, when it comes uh, in terms of pricing, what I would rather do is I'd rather find ways to create better value. So I would rather give them more perks and not have to discount my two most precious commodities, which is my time and my knowledge that I'm giving to that student. Because what's gonna happen, and this is just the human psyche, is that pricing, uh, people get used to discounts. They never get used to free. So I would almost rather give away something for free than actually give a discount, like 25% off, something like that, okay? Um, and then I'll, obviously, we wanna try to create that value. What else can we give them for this time? And maybe I might lose a little bit of time or a little bit of money on it in that regard, but I don't mind because I'm still getting paid my same price. Because the moment I start to go down in price and I start to discount, they're going to wonder why I can't be like that all the time. If I, give them, if I give them something for free, they know, hey, this is free. I'm not going to get this every time. Let me take advantage of it. But discounts, they're just going to get used to those discounts, uh, at, at least from my experience. Again, you, you want to create value. You want to make them realize how much they missed you. Wow, Kyle. I'm so happy to be back on the courts and holy cow, all of these things that you're doing. I, I just love it. And, and that online Academy that, that you started, Oh, it's so great. It made me miss tennis even more, right? You want to hear them say that you want to hear them say that they miss tennis and how good they actually had it. Okay. Um, I want to take a quick break because I see that we're getting a few questions here uh, and I have no problem. I, I forgot to mention in the beginning, uh, feel free to ask questions in the text box. I do apologize for that. Uh, I, I know you have some questions. And also, a couple of you emailed me before this webinar, and you had some questions. So what I want to do is I actually want to answer uh, a couple of those questions now, and I will save a few questions towards the end, okay? So the first question here is from uh, Jamie. Jamie from North Carolina. And here, let me go back there so you guys can see me when I answer these questions. So I have an email here from Jamie from North Carolina. And Jamie says, uh, hi, Coach Kyle. Uh, I'm a teacher and a tennis coach, uh, a public school teacher and tennis coach in North Carolina. That's awesome, Jamie. Thank you for, for being a teacher. I'm sure you're very good at it. Jamie says, uh, I'm doing a great job, or I feel I'm doing a great job in engaging my, my students and my, my school students and my tennis students on online virtual classes. However, my biggest fear is that when I'm done engaging them, that that lesson is then lost because there's a lack of engagement from the parents. How do I increase? parent engagement and make them a part of this process. Okay, 
Jamie, that is an awesome question. And I hope you're staying safe in North Carolina. And thank you for, for what you do for being a public school teacher and also a tennis coach. So in terms of engagement with parents, uh, one thing I like to do in these situations, and again, people talk about how this is unprecedented, but in terms of school closing and a mass school closing, like we've had across the country, uh, it, it's important to try to look at some sort of precedent from before. And if we go back in history, uh, this isn't the first time that we've had mass school closings in, in this country. We can go all the way back to 1930 uh, in Chicago, uh, there was a polio uh, epidemic or a polio outbreak. And so in order to, to protect the kids, the, the, the school children, they sent them home, they closed out the schools, and they actually started doing classes over the radio. Obviously, they didn't have the internet or Zoom technology back then. So they actually went uh, over the radio and each, each specific school had their own radio station that they could tune into. And when they tuned into it, they would get their, their, their daily lesson or, or have their class. And so what ended up happening is, yes, the teachers would teach this class, but they would actually give rewards to the parents and they would actually keep the parents engaged by doing this, right? So a kid that had the best grade in the class, the parent could then get rewarded because, hey, the parent is now being an active part. They're helping out their, their child with, with the homework, with, with, the, with the school lesson. Uh, a, a child that had the biggest improvement, right? The parent would get a reward because, again, the parents became an active part of this process. So the answer is, let's take a page from 90 years ago. Uh, I, I know that sounds weird, like what can we learn 90 years ago, but we can actually learn quite a bit. Uh, so let's take a page from the Chicago School District in the 1930s, and let's actually give uh, certain assignments or projects to the parents. Let's keep the parents engaged uh, by helping out their kids make this a, a child and parent project, uh, but give the parents some sort of reward or some sort of shout out even if you want to, uh, just saying, hey, you know, uh, Johnny had the most improved score in the last two weeks. Congratulations to, to Johnny's parents. And it's amazing uh, when you give that sort of, of positive reinforcement, just how engaged they do become. So if you want the parents more engaged, um, just start giving those, those small little rewards and start giving them shout outs and let them know that they also play a critical part. And then the parents can have a little competition with each other as to making sure that they're helping their kids. It's not just the kids are going online to listen to you and then that's the end of, 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 of the lesson. Instead, it's, hey, this is what I learned. What can the parents do to, to kind of help them out? Okay, uh, I, hope that, I hope that helps. But that, that's a great question. Thank you, Jamie, in North Carolina. Next question we have is from Raul in Texas. Raul, I hope you're staying safe in Texas. Um, Raul asked, and this is, this is a little bit off topic, but I have no problems answering this, and we'll get into more uh, professional tennis stuff probably in, in future webinars. But I, I, I do want to answer this. Raul was nice enough to, to email me. Um, Raul asks, with the dominance of the big three, uh, Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, with the dominance of the big three, uh, how do you think it is affecting tennis? Is tennis, are tennis fans becoming uh, tired or are they, are they tired of the redundancy? And do you think that some new champions will emerge? Okay, so to, to answer this question, I, I, I don't really care either way if Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic win every other Grand Slam. Uh, again, this is where maybe I, I'm trying to stay in my three-foot world. I can't control that. I've been lucky enough to see all of them play in person live. Uh, they're all fantastic tennis players. Um, but in terms of their dominance, 
I, I don't really see it as an issue. Um, and in terms of no other players stepping up in terms of the next generation stars stepping up, again, uh, I think it's all going to happen in due time. What we need to look at this as is uh, some sort of sociological uh, dilemma that we have. And it's not really so much a dilemma. It's probably the wrong choice of words. But this is something that happens in society, and it has happened in society for hundreds of years. Uh, the moment you have a, a social environment, which we all live in, in which tennis is, and you're pursuing things of value, um, you're going to have what we call a hierarchy, right? There are going to be people who are, who are simply better at something than other people, okay? And so when we look at this from a sociological perspective, I think it'll make, it'll make a lot more sense and it'll help hopefully people that listen to this understand that whether you have big, big two, big three, big four, or you have nobody at all, this is just kind of uh, a pendulum swinging back and forth, okay? You're going to have uh, time lapses in anything, in a social environment where there's too much power on one side and then what happens? That power then goes to the other side. So if you're going to pursue things of value in a social environment, you're going to produce a hierarchy. Uh, now that's unavoidable because some people are better at whatever it is that you value so that when it lays itself out socially, it's going, it's going to produce a hierarchy. That's guaranteed. It, it's, it's much like politics, right? If the Republicans take over or, or the right wing takes over, then what's going to happen? The other side is going to complain, oh, they have too much power. Uh, they become corrupt. And then it's going to swing the other way. And then the left wing, or let's say, let's say uh, the other opposing political party is now then going to take over and then they have too much power and the other side's going to complain. So, but that hierarchy of the big three, it has a necessity. If you are going to pursue things that you deem valuable, uh, but it also has a risk, it can ossify, it can become corrupt. And that's when the hierarchy that gets produced is going to now dispossess a number of people because there are people in the hierarchy that aren't good at it and they will be dispossessed. But again, it, it happens all the way through. And if you look at the rankings, specific example, tennis, after Sampras kind of was towards the end of his career and he, he retired, there was that little quick span of, you had, I think, Guga, uh, Leighton Hewitt, Assassin, they were all kind of battling for number one. And then what ends up happening? Then the media gets on and says, oh, there's no great superstar in tennis. Is tennis dying? And, and then what happens? Then this guy Federer comes up. This guy Federer comes up. And then he starts winning everything. And now everyone's saying, oh, Federer's winning everything. It's unstoppable. Tennis is becoming boring because Federer's winning everything. And then Nadal comes up. So, you know, either way, you can either have someone that's completely dominant or people, a few people that are completely dominant, or what you can do is you can have nobody that's truly dominant and everyone just kind of has sort of a chance. But if everyone sort of has a chance, then maybe you could argue tennis loses its appeal because they don't have that one superstar that, that, that really can step up. So you're not going to make everybody happy. In terms of the big three, I think tennis has been so lucky to have them. Uh, but in terms of in, in terms of what they mean for tennis or if they're destroying tennis, absolutely not. Uh, it's just something that sociologically it happens. And so when Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic leave, you might have, you know, a, 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 quiet, a quiet era, maybe two, three seasons, where no one's really stepping up, uh, which for all the people that think the big three is becoming boring, no one's going to step up now. So now is that more boring or is it more exciting? Don't know. It's, it's 50, 50. It, it just depends on, on, on your personality and what you feel. But again, that's something that happens in, in society all the time. There's always going to be a hierarchy when you, uh, 
uh, live in a social environment and you pursue things of value, right? People, someone is out there is better than you at whatever you do. Um, it's very rare to be, to be the best. And, and statistically, numerically speaking, you can't have multiple number ones. You can't have multiple number fives. It's, there's, there's one person that, that's better at it than what you do, but there might also be a lot of people that are worse at it. So sorry for the long, the long explanation, but I, I think that's, that's very important to, to understand. Um, but the big three have done nothing but great things for tennis. Uh, when they do leave, they leave. I can't control it. Uh, but let's just enjoy it for, for, for what it is exactly. Okay. Let's go back to, to the slideshow and let's see, uh, where we were. Okay. So we left off at having a plan to reopen. Okay. This is good. So this is, this is, I think our, our last slide here. So number five, smile. This is the fifth step. This is the fifth act that you need to be able to have in order to, to not only survive, but also thrive uh, in this, in this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic that we are living in. Okay. Uh, that, uh, that little boy on the horse up in the, in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, I think it's the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, it, yes, that is me. Uh, I wonder what happened to that beautiful thick blonde hair. Uh, but that's okay. I'm, uh, I'm much more aerodynamic now. So completely built for speed. So I want to share with you guys a little story. So I was, uh, a few years old and I think I, I might've been uh, three years old in this picture. I was, I was a pretty big baby or a kid as, as you can see. Uh, and I still am. But uh, I, I, was, I discovered that I was born with a very rare condition. Uh, and this condition is something that I have looked at as a positive. It has benefited me immensely uh, because I've made it work for me. And that rare condition that I was born with is called enthusiasm. I, I find joy and pleasure in some of the most mundane things. I know the last couple of weeks I've been, like I said, I've been painting fences and I've been cleaning out gutters and I've been, uh, I've been resurfacing courts, putting up windscreens, all the things that aren't glamorous, but you know what? I, I, I took the challenge. I did it. I enjoyed myself. I was still laughing the whole time. I absolutely love doing stuff. Doesn't matter what I, I I can I can I can make it enjoyable. Um, I absolutely love it, and this is critical because we as tennis coaches are the rock stars, right? Our students look up to us. We have to be a, a motivating, inspiring figure in our students' life. So you are a role model, whether you want to believe it or not. I, I know there was a there was an ad years ago. I believe it was with Charles Barkley, and he was saying, you know, I'm not your role model, but Essentially, we as coaches, we play such an integral role in the life of our students, right? Outside of our parents, uh, you know, what, what person in your life had the most impact? You're probably not going to say your accountant or your gastroenterologist. What you're going to say is there was a coach or a teacher that played a significant part of your life. So it's very important that we understand this. I, I call it a rock star without the perks. And what I mean by that is when I walk into to the grocery store that's across from my club, I'll run into a whole bunch of my members. And those members have kids and the kids are yelling my name and you know, people that don't know me, other customers at the, at the supermarket, you know, they're looking at me like I'm some sort of celebrity. You know, I have, I have all, these, all these moms waving their arms at me saying, calling out my name and I have these kids running up to me and it, it, it's an amazing feeling, but you truly feel like a rock star when you can provide some sort of positivity and enthusiasm. And, you know, when you smile, it does an amazing thing. It is 100% organic. It is a natural painkiller, right? When you smile, every time you smile, and I'm pretty sure that when this slide came up 
and you saw that picture of me riding that horse intently, I'm having a great time. The horse is having a great time. I'm sure it made you smile. So smile releases the dopamine, the endorphins, the serotonin. It lowers the heart rate, the blood pressure. I'm telling you, you won't get any bad side effects. No negative side effects from a smile. You might do it from, from medicine that, that could make you feel better, but you cannot get a bad side effect from a smile. So they're, they're natural painkillers. Um, and just realize you are making it through this. If you're on this webinar right now, the 459 of you that are on this webinar currently, you, you are making it through this. We are almost done with this. We will be back on courts before you know it. Life will return back to a new normal, but we are going to do this. And it is awesome. You should give yourself a major pat on the back. Just realize, I tell this to all my players, tough times don't last, tough people do. And there's nobody tougher that I can think of than tennis coaches, tennis teaching professionals. We do some really tough work. And I'm telling you what, we are the absolute toughest. So we are going to make this through. Uh, I have no doubts in my mind. If any of you guys uh, need a quick pep talk, if any of you guys or girls for that matter, sorry, I've been saying guys this whole time. I do apologize. I do know we have a few females on here. But if anyone needs uh, any sort of, of pep talk, uh, if, if any of you need or want to see some sort of light at the end of the tunnel, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. But I'm telling you, we as an industry are so awesome. Uh, so many people have stepped up to the plate offering, offering great webinars, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, tennis coaches are just the absolute best. I love it. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, I know your time is valuable. For you to spend it with me, uh, I could not think of, of a better compliment. And it, it's been a privilege. Uh, there's my information on the screen. If you want to contact me, if you want to reach out to me, please, please, please do so. Uh, social media, I'm on there too. Uh, but if you enjoyed this, and I really hope you did, and 459 people, so clearly there, there's, there's some sort of interest in this. Uh, if you're interested, I will be doing another webinar. Please check the website and social media. I, I will be updating it. And the next webinar, I'm happy to say, I'm going to stop the share screen here. The next webinar, I am going to have a special guest. Uh, he's going to be, uh, uh, he's, I, I talked to him the other day. He's very excited. Uh, his name's Julian Alonzo. Uh, he's one of my best friends. I've known him for quite a few years. Uh, I'll have to talk him up big time. Uh, with his uh, with his resume because he's such a humble guy he would never do it uh, and discuss it but uh, he's going to be my guest next week we will talk about uh, his background his coaching philosophies uh, he's also one of my he's also one of my clients but he more importantly he is a friend and I do want to bring him on I think he has some great insights he is the coach of uh, the Dutch player Arantxa Russ. Uh, she's top 100 uh, right now, and he's been uh, the coach of some great ATP players as well as some WTA Tour players. And uh, I think that he has a lot of great insights. Uh, it's a different perspective. Uh, he also played on the tour for, for quite a few years. So anyways, that's going to be next week. Please uh, watch the social media channels of, of Sets Consulting and visit the website. I'll have all the meeting information on this website, uh, but I will have Julian Alonzo on next week as my special guest. Uh, I can't wait to talk to him and see him. I talk to him about every day, but I haven't seen him in, in uh, over a year because he was supposed to come down to Miami uh, to do a training block just before uh, the Miami Open, uh, and he was going to do it with me at my club and have a rancha there and everything. So Anyways, um, please stay tuned for that. Thank you guys so much. And oh, you know what? I see that we have some questions. So before I leave, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Before I leave, I want to really get to those questions. So one question here from Dan Beadle. Uh, Dan Beadle says, how can I 
engage with my membership if I, uh, if the club has closed down, I just changed jobs and the club closed down two days before I arrived. Okay, well, Dan, first and foremost, I hope you're safe. Sounds like you are. Congratulations on the new job. Uh, bad luck, bad timing, but we're, we will get through this, okay? So one thing that I think you can do, and I don't know what the policies are at your club, but you might wanna to talk to the general manager and you might wanna find out from the general manager, can you send out some sort of mass email, obviously introducing yourself. And then once you introduce yourself, you know, tell them your background, give them some, some tennis tips that they can do at home. But yeah, I mean, again, it's important that you have to reach out to them. The last thing you want is for them to, to come to the club one day or their first day back and then see you and not know who you are at all not know your background, what you're even doing there. So I think it's important to reach out to the full membership, let them know your bio, give them a few tennis tips, maybe shoot some fun videos, just give them a sense of your personality of what you're all about. But I, and I, I don't think the general manager should have an issue with that, but, and I'm, I'm sure you're a smart guy. You might've been thinking that already, but I, I do suggest going out there making sure that you engage with them somehow, either online or through a video, a mass video that you can send out. But yeah, it, it's absolutely important that you still engage. Even if the membership doesn't know who you are, you need to know who they are. And then eventually they're gonna get to know you and, and why you're actually there, okay? Stay safe, Dan. Um, next question is from uh, David Slater. Okay, David, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you are safe wherever you are. Uh, David Slater asks, uh, how do you, well, thanks for the webinar. Thank you, David. Uh, he, he asked, oh, okay, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to award this properly here because there's, uh, okay. So David Slater says, how do you, change direction or pivot into uh, teaching or into getting off the court and actually getting into more of a specialty like mental, mental tennis or, or mental toughness. So, okay, David, so real quick, uh, good question. How do you kind of take that from just being your average teaching pro to then going into something uh, more specialized like, like mental tennis? Okay, or, or, or mental toughness, I should say. So uh, the way I kind of did it, and I'm known for my, for my mental toughness emails that I sent out, and the only way I, I was known for that is because, number one, I, I like to write. And so when I had these ladies teams in Boca, the day before every match, I would send out some sort of email on strategy or tactics or some sort of like mental toughness email. Uh, and it, it, it wasn't too complex, but it was just a, an in, interesting concept. And I kind of, you know, enhanced it a little bit with, with some wording and maybe even a few pictures. But what I did is I sent it out to the whole team and the teams started liking it so much that they would tell other teams and then they would tell their friends at other clubs. And then I just kind of became known as I'm the coach that sends out these great emails. So I think it, it really starts with something as simple as kind of building that presence, sending out a few emails, um, doing it in a way that is not necessarily trying to sell something, but just saying, hey, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about you guys. You guys are going to benefit so much from this. And, you know, to just make them feel as though, make them feel as though, you know, you're doing this for them, which in essence, yes, you are doing it for them, but obviously you have a bigger purpose, which is kind of to take your platform to a whole nother level. But for the most part, they were your inspiration. So you're going to test it on them. And then when you test on them, say, hey, I know a couple of weeks ago you had that match and you really struggled trying to pull out the match. You were up 5-2 in the third set and it got a little tight and you were lucky to win 7-5, but you know, this, this is exactly what happened to you. And this was your mental state. 
and they're going to read it and they're going to agree with it and say, wow, this is so amazing. I didn't know what was going on, but thank you so much for helping me. And then you kind of make it, you know, geared towards them. And then once they build on it, then you can go above and beyond and you can start sending out to a whole lot of people. And then your reputation will kind of be, Hey, you're that great mental tennis coach. Um, and then, you know, start an online presence, uh, maybe, maybe host a webinar, start listening to a lot of podcasts so you can get some ideas. Uh, you can start to develop some sort of philosophy uh, about it. And then you can kind of have your own voice. I, I think that's really important. I, I think a lot of people, when they start off, they, they start taking ideas and, and, and words from other people. Uh, and then you just kind of sound like a clone of someone who's actually better at it than you. And instead, you want to listen to a whole bunch of different perspectives and then do some, own, do some of your own research and find out what works best for you, how you feel about it, and if, if, if it actually sounds genuine, like it's coming from you. Okay? Um, so I think, that's, I think that's a good place to kind of end it. David, that's a great question. Good luck with everything. If you need any help, uh, please let me know. Reach out to me. Uh, I would, I would love to help you out more with that. It sounds like you're on the right path. You just kind of needed that little, that little push, but I know you're a smart guy and I'm sure you'll, you'll do very well with it. So with that being said, the 459 of you uh, that have joined me, I, I still can't believe that number. That's absolutely amazing. So the 459 of you that joined me, thank you so much. Uh, we will be having another webinar next week. Please check the website www.setsconsult.org uh, or check my social media. I will have an update on the time for the next webinar, special guest, uh, Julian Alonzo. And for that, uh, thank you very much. If Again, if I can help you guys in any way, please let me know, reach out to me. Uh, again, uh, I'm here to help and I'm here to set you up, to set you apart. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much. Carpe diem. Bye.